All right, this is Dylan Bowker with Sports Kita MMA and very excited to be talking to an individual whose accolades speak for themselves, multiple time former UFC heavyweight champion, as well as a former light heavyweight champion in the promotion and doing great things as a PFL commentator and just so many great things to talk about in the sport of mixed martial arts. Happy to have on Randy, the natural couture. How's your day going so far, man? Going well, going very well. Hanging out up in Vancouver, British Columbia, working on a film up here, headed to uh, Washington, D.C. this evening on a red eye to get to uh, the PFL fights in the last playoff show here coming up on Friday. So uh, no rest for the wicked. <laughs> it's kind of interesting you say that. I was looking back at an interview we had done circa 2021, and you were talking about readying to work on the Expendables 4. Like, is this a different film, or was it also Expendables related, this filming? No, not Expendables related. This one's called Pitfall. It's, a, it's kind of a horror genre film. Um, yeah, I've been working on it for a couple of weeks now. I've got another week to go to finish it up. But uh, taking a taking breaks to fit in the PFL playoffs fights in between. So uh, definitely getting my frequent flyer miles. And I mean, we've talked about how stacked each of the divisions has been in previous years, as I had referenced like a past interview we had done. It seems like that sentiment is only just that much more underscored this season, just with PFL having acquired Bellator. Like, how have you been enjoying watching the overall season and just everything with like the latter stages of the playoffs here as we're readying to get into that world championship kind of period. Yeah. As if the uh, format wasn't tough enough, I think absorbing, you know, 215 Bellator fighters, many of which are marquee names that people know, uh, definitely up the game uh, in every weight class across the board. I mean, having Liz Carmouche as one of their champs step up and put it on the line in the regular season. Uh, this season was amazing to watch and she's an amazing competitor and you know didn't didn't quite make it through but uh was still a blast to watch and, and see um yeah from top to bottom the the roster got a lot deeper a lot tougher i mean look at light heavyweight obviously we just got contested last week in in florida and that's a it's a tough division you know have a returning champ like will wilkinson not make it into the finals you know this season that's an indication that just how tough it's gotten uh, and it's already a big challenge fighting, you know, four times in eight months. Uh, but adding those names and those guys and deepening the roster the way we did definitely made this season unique. It's been fun to watch. Yeah, it's always fun to watch the season structure that PFL utilizes, but exciting news with the Super Fight division getting ready to, you know, be showcased with the pay per view on Saturday, October 19th, the return of. Francis Ngannou to MMA, the lineal heavyweight champion of the sport, taking on PFL's heavyweight king, Henan Ferreira. And then also, I mean, Chris Cyborg versus Larissa Pacheco. Yeah. I mean, what a stacked card already. I mean, just even those two fights alone, it's like that's like the mark on the calendar, map out your night kind of a thing. Yeah, absolutely. Excited for that uh, on October 19th. Uh, still haven't heard where it's going to be, but uh, I suspect it might be in Riyadh, a fair chance that, that that might be in Saudi Arabia and part of the whole MENA with the launch of Middle East, North Africa this year and, and that new season and feeder program going very, very well. I think that may be where we end up, but I'm not going to jump the gun. I don't know yet. <laughs> uh, excited about that card for sure. And they're building a heck of a card. It's going to be amazing. Those two fights alone, as you said, are, are worth the money are worth watching and tuning in to see how that, that gets settled excited to see francis back in camp back training you know letting the dust settle after after the boxing excursions with fury and and the likes and then and then obviously the tragedy with his son and glad to see he's coming out the other side of that and, and uh i think everybody's excited to uh to see him compete and see him come back to the cage and, and fight in mma again and I kind of referenced it in the comment I'd made about the fight a bit ago. Like, it's not an official distinction per se, but I just love fight nerd kind of stuff, basically. I feel like that's kind of like a big thing for me, like the lineal MMA heavyweight title. And that's something you're very much tied directly into, like when you first had left the UFC to kind of just put yourself out there in like a free agency kind of capacity or testing the market as the reigning heavyweight champion. So, I mean, that really dates back to you. And then it's kind of cool also that it's getting back to that tradition of being fought for under different promotional banners. Like, I mean, nothing wrong with the UFC per se, but I mean, it just has that tradition of, you know, being fought for in pride and strike force, Bodog, affliction, etc. Yeah, well, I think champions versus champions was a big fight. That was a big deal. We absorbed 
their their you know the Bellator roster, and, and that includes their champions like Johnny Eblen, who's arguably one of the best 185 pounders on the planet right now. And so to have that big show where their champs versus our champs is something I think people wanted to see back in the Pride days when I was chasing the Fedor fight and and trying to make that fight happen. You know that that lends itself to the lack of transparency in our sport and some of the issues that we have as fighters in our sport that we need to unite, create a fighters association, and really kind of force the promoters to create some minimum standards for us as athletes and how we get paid and how much of the purses and the pie that we get paid and you know some 401ks and health insurance wouldn't be a bad thing to, to negotiate for as well those are things that i think in our sport need to be accomplished and they're only going to happen by us the promoters are not going to step up and do that and one of the reasons why i work for the pfl because they're doing a much better job of taking care of these fighters paying these fighters better uh, creating opportunity, the whole thing with Francis coming to the PFL. Why? Because he was, they were willing to give advocacy to the fighters and give the fighters a voice in their, in the way they're regulated. Make Francis the chairman of opportunity for PFL in Africa. That's a big deal to him. And it would have been a big deal to me. And, and I, I agree and understand why he left the belt and, and the UFC and, and, and arguably the biggest promotion in the sport. To, to pursue his dream and create opportunity for other athletes like him that struggle in that continent of Africa to, to get where they want to be and to, to achieve their dreams. So it's all wrapped up in the same thing. And then why these shows are important, why this big fight with Henan Ferreira is, is very, very important. It's important to the landscape of our sport, not just the PFL. So uh, I think that's how, you know, that's how I see it. And I think the PFL has done a lot of things right. And I think they're going to continue to set the bar and do the right things for the athletes. Yeah, it's a great thing for the sport of mixed martial arts overall. And I mean, I'm glad Francis is getting what he wants out of the situation because, I mean, he'd also always talked about wanting to box, which he's gotten to, you know, concurrently mm -hmm. do now and everything like that. And I mean, I think some people value this more than others, but I think like the, I guess, dynamic that a lot of people are maybe wary of is kind of, I guess something that also sort of happened to you where it's like as much as you're like going out there to, you know, test yourself and really, you know, get your biggest prize possible as a prize fighter. Like it seems like the UFC sometimes tries to really control that narrative. And that was kind of a talking point over the weekend with Israel Adesanya mentioning how you can never erase history when they had omitted Nganu from one of their pieces. So like, I guess, what are your thoughts on all of that? I would think that based on your anecdotal experience, you're perhaps not surprised, but thought to ask all the same. Yeah, I, I'm not surprised at all. They've done their best to whitewash me out of the books as well. That's how they treat anybody that doesn't go along with, with their good old boys club. Honestly, that's, that's the way they handle it. And if you're on the outs with Dana, then that's how you're going to be treated. That's just the way it is. So I'm not surprised at all. Uh, and, and you know, there, there'll be many others. Uh, coming, you know, coming into the same boat, being persona non grata as I am and have been because I held their feet over the contracts for ancillary rights and what those ancillary rights meant to me and wasn't just willing to let them do with me whatever they wanted. And if I had, I wouldn't have gone very far because they didn't think I was marketable as a 40 year old heavyweight champion. And obviously I kept proving them wrong and winning fights. They didn't think I was going to win. And, and that's just, I mean, that's how it is. Um, so, yeah, you, you're absolutely correct. I'm not surprised that that's how it's gone down. You know, Chuck and so many other fighters that, you know, Tito, Frank Shamrock. I mean, there's a long list of guys that fought for the company, did their best to promote the company and the sport in, in a positive way. And at the end of the day, they, they really got dumped on. And that's just, you know, that's the M.O. That's why there's a huge class action lawsuit hanging out there and probably going to court here in October because of the way that company does business and, and the lack of transparency in our sport across the board. Uh, that's what the Ali Act and amending the Ali Act would do is, is create that transparency, eliminate the restrictive contracts, make the fighters, promoters, disclose how much money they're making off any individual event. And then the fighters will be able to gauge exactly how much of that money that's coming in off of their backs and their sweat and their blood in that cage goes back to the fighters, the athletes that are actually putting it on the line and how much goes to the promoters. There's the flaw and there's the issue in our sport right now. And you kind of touched on it there. Like, what do you see kind of unfurling with that story of the lawsuit? Because like there had been a settlement that they seemed to have come there, there to terms with settlement. earlier in the year, but then yeah. the trial for October. Yeah. So like, yeah. what are your thoughts yeah. on how that might unfold, I guess? 
I mean, it, it's hard to speculate. This has been a 10 year process. You know, three of the biggest law firms that handle class actions took this on and spent their own time and their own money to, to get us this far. And so, you know, there must be some merit there. Obviously the judges certified the class and they wouldn't have certified the class if there wasn't some merit in, in the arguments that were being presented. Uh, uh, face value, $335 million looks like a lot of money. But if you look at the actual pool of over 1200 fighters for that time period, it's a slap on the wrist. It's not that much. And I think the judge saw it that way too. And so he wasn't willing to stamp that settlement and, and go forward with that agreement. Uh, he wants to go back to court. He wants to see more in evidence. And, and in, I think most estimations were the settlement would probably end up being in the billions, one or $2 billion, not 335 million. So uh, again, it, at face value, three hundred thirty-five million is a lot of money, but if you if you break it down and look at the actual pool and class that, that's in question, it, it really doesn't go that far, and it doesn't begin to cover uh, the potential revenue that those athletes in that time frame should have made or could have made. And you consider that with what the company sold for in twenty sixteen at four point two billion dollars. That gives you an indication. Here's something they bought in two thousand one. And yes, they spend a lot of time, money, and energy to, to build the sport and the brand up to where it is now and be able to sell it in 2016 for $4.2 billion. But that was a huge red flag for a lot of fighters. Like, how much? Oh, my God. They haven't been paying me nearly a month. So, I mean, at, at the end of the day, it's that lack of transparency that we're all seeking as athletes across the board. We need that transparency. Yeah, and I guess speaking of, you know, that, I mean, I wasn't even necessarily planning to ask you this but it's just what you're talking about <laughs> kind of sparked something here like you were talking or i was talking to frank mir rather yesterday and he was talking about the sum that he was paid to fight brock lesnar and it was kind of shocking to hear honestly like i'm not necessarily asking for like the specific sum but was that something that you had also felt with your brock lesnar fight because he fought you just before he had got in there with Mir. Like it seemed like he got a certain amount on the back end with pay-per-view points, but just curious to kind of pose that to you, I suppose. Yeah, you know, I, I was never squawking over fighter pay. I, you know, I was, I was being. There was an issue where I, I was, I felt like I was being lied to, and and I called them to, to task and had a big meeting with them. This is when I stepped out of the sport in '06, and and, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I think we all think we deserve our fair share of what's being brought in and I don't think any athletes had any idea until they saw that sale number in 2016 exactly how much money this company had been bringing in off their blood sweat and tears um, you know now you're hearing John Jones and Francis and other fighters squawk and Jake Paul poking Dana in the chest over the fight pay because of those bikes boxers you know MMA fighters that crossed over and did the trillers and and the crossover fights and made way more money off those one single boxing matches than they ever made in MMA, which again is a, a, a shining a light on the issue and the lack of transparency in our sport. Absolutely, and I'm sure there's a ton of questions I could ask you, but I do want to be mindful of your time and sort of the, I guess, increment that was outlined to me by PFLPR. I want to be respectful to them too for facilitating setting this up. But I guess one of the last things I wanted to talk to you about just this whole situation with the lineal heavyweight champion in UFC, John Jones, and interim champion Tom Aspinall having defended his title, and then I guess also the context of Alex Pereira potentially thinking about going up to heavyweight to capture that third belt. Like, what are your state, or what is your thought, rather, on the state of the overall heavyweight picture right now in the UFC there? Uh, the only heavyweight picture I'm focused on is the PFL heavyweight picture, to be honest. Uh, none of those guys are my guys at Extreme Couture. And if, you know, if Francis was still in the mix and, and, and still fighting for that title and, and defending his title in the UFC, then I'd have an opinion there. But none of those guys are, are connected to me or my gym or my training center or my team. And, and you know, therefore, I, I don't really have an opinion. It is what it is. Uh, it's been this way for a while. Why is there an interim championship to begin with? Because that's going to sell and get more fans' attention. Well, they don't use the rankings they have. They bypass those all the time, and they have consistently. The, the model they're using is way more the WWE model than it is a prize fighting model, where rankings are actually adhered to, and you have to fight that guy that's ranked ahead of you to move up the chain and move up the ladder, unless there's injuries involved and things like that, uh, where, where you can pass somebody who's ranked ahead of you. And again, that's all 
in the same boat of lack of transparency. It's way too much power for the promoter to be making matches and ranking those same fighters that are going to get those those matches. That That's not the way prize fighting really works. One of the reasons why I love the PFL model in, the, in this true sports format with a regular season, a playoff, and a championship every year. And if you don't get to the championship that year, do the reset. And next year, sharpen your tools and come back and, and get another crack at it the next season. Um, it's not the traditional prize fighting model either, but it, it makes a lot more sense. It's meritocracy. It's not about publicity stunts and talking crap. It's about going out and winning fights and scoring points and, and making it to the playoff and getting a crack at that million dollar purse and, and that big shiny belt. Uh, I like that format. Uh, it simplifies things. You're not waiting for the phone to ring and Dana White to tell you when your next opponent's going to be and when that fight's going to be. You know it's laid out and you know if you do it right and compete well, you got a very, very good chance of being in the, that next season the next year if you don't make it to the championship. That lack of transparency using, you know, a willy-nilly ranking system and just doing whatever you want because at the end of the day it's about the bottom line how much pay-per-view are we going to sell and how many fans are we going to get from this fight that's the wwe that's that's not prize fight and that's a big flaw in our sport and most people most of the fans don't recognize that they don't see the difference um so i'm happy that you know jake paul is highlighting that through these crossover boxing matches i think it's something that needs to be addressed in our sport and I think the PFL is doing a pretty fine job of, of doing, a, you know, taking care of the athletes better, paying them better, giving them a voice uh, in, in how they're regulated and, and how things go. Yeah. And I mean, Jake Paul now being involved in the PFL, like it seems like he's doing well as like an ambassador and has entertained even stepping into the smart cage and whatnot. And like we were saying before, we got the lineal MMA heavyweight title fight coming up here. So yeah, a lot yeah. of cool stuff on the go, man. But like I keep reiterating, I do want to be mindful of your schedule, Randy. It's always great getting to talk to you. You're one of the all-time greats of the sport and continue to do great things to serve the sport. But I figured I'd give you the floor and see if there was maybe a final parting thought you were wanting to add as we're kind of wrapping up here, man. I do appreciate the time. You bet. I thank you for having me on. I'm excited about this playoff. It's our uh, our lightweights and our welterweights getting after it. Uh, excited to see Ray Cooper the third back in there. He's always an exciting fighter and he looks to be in, in Ray Cooper form uh, again. He, you know, he's had some things going on in his life that he's been dealing with. So I'm always excited to see him come stomping out of that tunnel. And then obviously the, uh, you know, the, the big matches, you know, with all of it on the line, uh, the last step to, to get a crack at that million bucks and that championship in the PFL this year. And there's some great matchups some really, really good fights. Obviously, one of my guys, Kamaka, getting in there against Brendan Lochnane, who's a former champ in the PFL and one of the very, very exciting fighter to watch. That's going to be a, a banger for sure. So uh, a lot of good fights and good matchups on this card. I'm excited. Get this one over with, do the highlight show, and we got our finals coming up in November. It's going to be amazing. Yeah, great times for the expansion, too. Like you'd mentioned PFL Africa and then also PFL MENA. And from some interviews I was seeing you were doing, it seems like PFL Australia isn't necessarily super far off. So super exciting times. And we'll have to arrange a chat to talk about that at a later juncture as well. But thanks so much for taking the time today with Sports Kita MMA. And just you have a great rest of your day, Randy. Thank you. You too. Be well.